Good evening, my dear famous fellows. I'm Rana Sedi, lecturer of operative dentistry at Ain Shams University. Today, I will be walking you through the role of teacher as a facilitator and mentor. The content of this chapter is taken from the eight rules of the medical teacher book by Roland Harding. Facilitation of learning should be the core objective of our teaching strategy. And as Carl Rogers once said, we cannot teach another person directly, we can only facilitate his learning. Facilitation of learning is different from te just teaching. So as teaching is a one directional dissemination of knowledge through a teacher, while facilitation is accompanying and shaping a learning process together, which will unlock the student's potential to learn and guide them in the process. So teacher, uh, the teacher is someone who is there to help the student in a very different concept than the, the teacher that is just there to provide information. So why? So why the switch is not easy? Why we would rather uh, act as an information provider rather than a facilitator? The answer to this is that usually an information provider is more attractive to staff and students, which is due to the lack of the individual awareness. Also, we feel stronger and more comfortable serving as a, serving as a subject expert rather than responding to the challenge of facilitating the student's learning. Also, it's more familiar and corresponds what, to what was to, uh, taught to us as a students. Uh, moreover, facilitator, facilitator usually is perceived as having less power and authority to an expert on information. So why we should act as a facilitator? The role of facilitator can empower both the teacher and the student and can have much greater impact on the student's learning, helping each learner to reach his full potential, create a passion for learning, and the, an, an important asset of facilitator is that he provides individualized feedback to his students. So how can we facilitate learning? Robert Harden uh, elaborated on four approaches to facilitate learning, which are clarifying the learning outcome, identifying learning opportunities, engaging the students in the learning, and making learning effective. In the next slides, we will be going through the uh, details of each approach. The first approach, which is clarifying the learning outcome, is based on two main pillars, which is the outcome-based education and the outcome-based progression. There have been a move from an emphasis on process and learning experience, such as lectures, small groups, practical activities and clinical work to the product or outcome of the education and the learning outcome that is ex expected from the student uh, and that he will master by the end of uh, this phase of the curriculum or by the end of the course or even uh, before graduation. This move to an outcome-based education has been described as the most significant development in medical education over the past two decades. While an outcome-based progression is a concept by which you can help students monitor their progress against each of the outcome domains, which is through the use of a milestone. Achievement of the milestone provides a measurable evidence of the learner's progression to the final expected learning outcome. That's why milestone is, def uh, is defined as a definite observed marker of an individual's ability along a developmental continuum. The second approach for learning facilitation is through identifying the learning opportunities. In this approach, we show how that the student can achieve the expected outcome. Students or trainees should be guided on the range of learning opportunities and resources available which might best suit their needs and how and where they can access them. This gives us a rise to the concept of directed or guided self-learning. We have a number of tools that can help identify learning opportunities. The most uh, popular ones are the use of a curriculum map and study guide, which will help direct and guide the learner. A curriculum map is important because it will give the student an overall picture of the curriculum, help them appreciate the expected learning outcomes, and see how these outcomes will be addressed and assessed. It also will help him plan his own study journey and makes the curriculum more transparent to different stakeholders. Also, it will facilitate communication to students about what, when, and where, uh, and where and how they can learn. It will also demonstrate to them how, they, how your teaching and your course will fit within other courses and will contribute to the achievement of the expected 
exit learning outcome. That's why now with the shifting toward a more centralized and less departmentally based curriculums, the curriculum map will be considered as the glue which will hold the curriculum together and will help the students connect the pieces together. The second tool which can, which can be used is the use of study guides. A study guides can be seen as providing a guided tour of the relevant areas of the curriculum map. The study guide pulls together all the learners should know about a course, what is expected of them, and the learning opportunities available. A study guide should include the following. The importance of the course, what is expected of the learning during the course, the expected learning outcome by the end of this course, an advanced organizer or framework for studying the topic, and the prerequisites and the knowledge and skills that the student is expected to master before the start of the course. It also should include relation to other courses, learning opportunities available, key core references to recommended sources, a glossary or definition of terms used, assessment methods, the provision of opportunities for learning to assess their own achievements, and how to contact a teacher if they have a problem. The third approach is by making learning effect, which can be achieved by applying the third principles, the use of concept maps, and by providing an educational environment supportive of learning. The FAIR principles is based on the provision of feedback to learners, providing active rather than passive learning, and individualization of learning, and by making learning relevant. Providing feedback is critical for the educational experience. The feedback provided should be effective, and I will share with you some guidelines on how to make your feedback effective. Your feedback should be timely, should be frequent, should be specific, and should not be limited only when the, when the student is not in his uh, best performance, but also to you should compliment the learner when a good performance is identified and, and to show him how to address and remedy his mistakes. Also, feedback should be a two-way process, not a unidirectional one. So there should be an active conversation between the teacher and the learner. Also, feedback is a mutual responsibility. Learners should be encouraged to reflect on the feedback received and what they will do following the recipient of this feedback. Also, seen from a longitudinal perspective, as it's provided across the curriculum, with learners reflecting on feedback previously provided and understanding the, learn the future opportunities for feedback. Also, learners should be encouraged to assess their own performance. The second principles in the FAIR principles is the active learning. Learning is facilitated if learners are actively engaged in the learning process. The activity can take a number of forms. Students can reflect on their experience and learning. They can apply what they already know to a new topic and apply their theoretical knowledge to solving pr practical problems. Also, they can assess their own competence in an area, for example, by using MCQs or using a checklist. Also, they can be engaged in a practical exercise or a project. And over time, they should build their learning portfolio, which describe their learning experience and demonstrate their achievements of the expected learning outcome. Also, they should share their knowledge with their colleagues. The third principle is the individualized learning. Teachers uh, should acknowledge that each student is different and their learning experience is different. They, they can be different in, uh, in terms of previous knowledge and understanding their ability to master a specific learning outcome, and their learning style, pace, and preferred time of learning. That's why, to facilitate students' learning, you should help them develop a learning plan which, go which goes in line with their personal learning needs. The last principle is the relevance of teaching. So, clinical correlation is a must for medical science teaching. Uh, students always acknowledge that the introduction to patients in the early years will help them see the relevance of what they are learning. That's why the concept of early clinical exposure is now very popular for students to understand the relevance of what they are taught in the first years of medical school, which is usually dedicated to basic science. The second method to make learning effective is by the use of concept maps. Concept map is a visual, visual representation of information or concepts with links and relationship between the items displayed. The map shows the network of related concepts, and the learner thinks and learns by linking new concepts to what is already known. And, and it will help him uh, see these pieces as a part of a larger jigsaw. 
in the use of concept map is that it will help students acquire problem solving and critical thinking skills, promote meaningful learning and integration of learning across disciplines, and it will assist uh, students in linking basic uh, science to clinical practice and it also make their thought process more visible and specific and will provide them for uh, by ways uh, to share their thinking and understanding and it will specify different and complementary role of, head of healthcare professionals in interprofessional education and it would also assess learners understanding and mastery of an area and it will help to teach evidence-based medicine. The last method to make learning effective is by creating a supportive learning environment. As a teacher, you can help create a learning environment that is conductive to the student's learning, both in the school in general and in your own uh, course. That's why you should always stop and ask yourself that the learning environment encourage students to approach you when they have a problem, does the environment encourage students to collaborate and support each other or to compete? Finally, does the environment encourage students to acknowledge their mistakes or not? The final approach uh, described by Hardin to facilitate learning is by engaging the students on the curriculum. Learning is a partnership between teachers and students. Supporting and developing this partnership is an essential role for you as a facilitator. That's why student voice should always be heard. And on today's agenda, it is a co-owned education with an ex expectation that students will take greater responsibility for learning. That's why students should be involved in the decision-making process through membership in committees and faculty boards. By this, we have, we have reached the end of our presentation. Please take your time and reflect on the following. Have you considered the importance of your role as a facilitator rather than simply an information provider? Do your students fully understand and expect the learning outcomes for your course? Do your students make the best use of the learning opportunities and resources available? Have you explored providing learners with a study guides to support and facilitate their learning? Is a curriculum map available for learners? relating the learning outcome to the learning experience and the, and the assessment? To what extent are the FAIR principles for effective learning incorporated into your teaching? Finally, to what extent are students engaged in your curriculum? I hope you have enjoyed and benefited from this MLWeb. I would like to thank our supervisor, Professor Zainab Said, and uh, my dear colleagues in this MLWeb, Dr. Dia Eddin Taha, Dr. Shayma Helmi, Dr. Al Hadi Miskin, Dr. Mustafa Shahid, and finally Dr. Sami Abdu. Thank you so much for your time and have a nice day.